Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to Wycliffe Hall and to this very exciting uh, event. Um, I'm Michael Lloyd. I'm the principal here at Wycliffe Hall. So if people tell you that Wycliffe is a completely unprincipled organisation, that's not true. <laughs> we have one. Um, one of our, well, our vision aims uh, here at uh, Wycliffe are to train lifelong disciple makers in community with what we think and hope is excellent Bible-centred teaching in the thought-provoking city of Oxford. And Oxford is an extraordinary thought-provoking city. It is a, center, a world centre of thought leadership. My old college where I was chaplain before coming here uh, was Queen's College, where you had old members like Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the internet. That's kind of influential. Um, and people like Rowan Atkinson, uh, at the other end of the extreme, doing the, the Mr. Bean films and all of that. Um, interestingly, the development office were always trying to get him to endow a chair, uh, and he deliberately misunderstood them and bought them a chair, <laughs> uh, which wasn't quite all they'd, they'd hoped for, I think. Oxford is also uh, the center of, the, of new atheism, uh, it is a very good place to study Christian theology, though I need to declare an interest in saying that. Uh, and it's a very good place to study Islam, hosting uh, the Oxford Centre for Islamic Studies and many a doctoral programme. So there you have three, and there's more of course, but there you have three of the most vibrant worldviews on the market today. What is of course vital is that those worldviews talk to each other and not just to communities of the like-minded. And that's where the Center for Muslim Christian Studies comes in with its logo that I always think looks rather like a Gothic version of the McDonald's logo. <laughs> uh, but, but there we are. So it's my very great pleasure to uh, welcome you to this exciting book launch uh, this evening. And it's a particular pleasure uh, personally to introduce our first speaker who has helped generations of Wycliffe students to get to know Islam uh, and to engage with it respectfully and humbly, humbly. It's very, very good to have you back, either from uh, your new pastures, the other side of the pond. And may I ask you to give a warm welcome to Ida Glasser. So I'm very proud of this book. So thrilled that it's come through. Um, the actual contributors of this book nearly all attended a conference that we had two and a half years ago. Uh, you, you can see them here, an amazing mixture of people, Christians and Muslims, and one or two who are neither, from all over the world, from different perspectives, um, Shiite Muslims, Sunni Muslims, um, Sufi Muslims, um, there's a Seventh-day Adventist there, some Roman Catholics, uh, Russian Orthodox, and a whole bundle of, of Protestants coming from all sorts of different perspectives. We were looking at this question of biblical interpretation in Islamic context, and people were invited to do what they liked, presenting papers in this area. And from the papers, we selected what we thought were good ones and put them together into this book. So it was a fun conference. We've had all sorts of interesting discussions. And here we see um, two of the editors. I'm afraid it was Shireen's camera, so you don't see Shireen in the photograph, but Danny and Shabir here discussing with one of the contributors to the book, Michael Lodal. And here's another one, um, Dan Madigan, who wrote a very interesting paper on John's Gospel as a good place for discussing uh, the nature of God and of Jesus with Muslim people. Now, of course, the conference has got a bit of a, um, a history as well, so I thought it might be helpful just to give you a little bit of a feel. Um, I suppose I've been reading the Bible in the context of Islam pretty deliberately for around 40 years now, and focusing on it more academically from when I did my doctorate, which is um, some time ago now. <laughs> Eventually, uh, when I was here in Oxford and really wanting to focus in on doing some biblical work in Islamic context, um, 
but rather struggling for health reasons and realizing there was so much I wanted to do and couldn't do it, I thought, the best thing to do is to try and encourage other people to do it. Because the Bible's a big book, and, uh, well, it's lots of books, and um, Islam is so varied. We, we, we've got worldwide phenomenon going on here. If only I could get a little bit of money, I could start and encouraging other people to do it. And I thought to myself, my particular concern is Christians faithfully reading the Bible in these contexts, but in order to do that, we need some Muslims who will work with us on this. Because if you don't hear how Muslims are responding to the Bible, then how can you really do this work thoroughly? So I began to look for two things. One was money, and I would like to acknowledge a very generous donor who would prefer to remain anonymous, um, but whose money has enabled us to do the research that has produ produced this book. But also, where was a Muslim scholar I could work with? And there was one Muslim scholar I knew who'd done some serious study of Paul, and I Googled him to find out where he was, sent him an email, and he wrote back to me and said, that's really interesting, Ida. I was just thinking about coming back to the UK from America where I'm working, and that was uh, Dr. Shabir Akhtar. So, Shabir came and we talked together and developed the idea of seeing whether Routledge might like to run a series on biblical interpretation in Islamic context. And um, where, where is, has Emma gone? Oh, you're there, Emma, yes. <laughs> so, um, very thankful to Routledge and to Joe Whiting in particular for um, having the vision to run with something that was a little bit uncertain and, shall we say, rather unusual. Uh, we started out, in addition to Shabir, with um, two postdoctoral scholars, um, Yelena Narinskaya and Aslam Sudani. Um, Yelena was with us for two years and Aslam for one. And we dug the ground together. And then after that, Shireen came to join us and Danny, and they worked through, helped organize the conference. They'll tell you some of what they're working on later. And as a result of that, we got to this book. Uh, just to s prove that I was there as well, um, and in the introduction, I was trying to talk a little bit about what I think this task is about. And in fact, what we've done since then told me that it was certainly not any more simple than I thought it was. So let me just share with you a little bit of what we're thinking about in reading the Bible in Islamic context. Uh, first of all, I guess everybody sitting here knows that whenever you read anything, you're doing it in a context. So sometimes um, in an academic world, you think you're not. Sometimes if you're very much in one particular Christian or Muslim context, you think that um, you've got some kind of objective only way of reading it. But in actual fact, we're always reading in context. And we're always, if we're reading scripture and we're reading things that scripture for us, we're always reading it because we want to apply it. Well, I hope we do, in our context and in our lives. So it's going to affect our context and our context is going to affect the questions we take to it. So if we're talking about Islamic contexts, they're quite complex because we're going to have in there the culture and all the things that are going on and the questions that are arising today. That's going to be true anywhere. But we also have in Islamic context, Islamic texts, in particular the Quran, and of course the Quran has a lot to say about the Bible. Thirdly, we've got a history. And there's a long history of Christians and Muslims reading each other's texts and criticizing each other's texts. And so much of the reading of the Bible in relation to Islam has been a competition rather than a serious trying to learn. So if we put this onto a you know, basic hermeneutic circle of text, 
context and praxis. One of the things I've realized through this process is that this looks different for a Christian reader and a Muslim reader. And if you read the different papers in the book, you will pick up some of these tensions. There's one particularly interesting paper that's co-authored by a Christian and a Muslim working together. We have, I think, the same num total number of Muslim contributors as we have Christian contributors, which is quite unusual for these books that are on the Muslim-Christian interface. And we can learn a lot by the way that the different writers approach the topics. So for the Christian reader, the text is kind of taken for granted. That's the Bible, and you'll come at the Bible from your particular perspective. In the context, we're going to have, as you say, the intertextual, reading alongside the Quran, comparative study. But there's a lot of comparative study. Not many people are going around and saying, what does that do to my reading of the Bible? Um, if the Quranic David doesn't seem to be anything like so sinful as the biblical David, and if Muslim people are telling me that David's sin is scandalous, what does that do for my reading of the Bible? Then there are the contextual and historical things, as I've suggested. Um, praxis, we're going to take this reading hopefully into our prayer and life and worship. The way we read the Bible is going to affect all these things. We're going to take it into our teaching of, of Christians. We're not just going to be sitting there teaching them the five pillars. And even the way we teach Genesis. I'm never going to teach the Adam stories the same again since I read the Quranic Adam stories. And then this very rich practice that we've developed of sitting reading it together so that together we can actually learn from the Bible, but we learn different things. What, though, about a Muslim reader? Well, there are some different questions. So, typically, readers of the Quran will use material from the Israeliat, that is, material that comes from the Jews and the Christians. Sometimes it's second, third, fourth hand, but it is material that you would only know from the biblical or Jewish or Christian material. And you need that in order to be able to understand a lot of the Quranic references. The question arises then, what do we do it the other way round if we use Islamic material as a lens for reading the Bible. That's interesting. And of course, a Muslim reading is bound to do that. Can a Christian also do that? What does that mean? Second, Muslims are likely to bring different concerns to their reading of scripture. Typical one is um, you know, somebody, a Muslim who, cleric who had read the Acts of the Apostles and was going to ask questions about it. I thought, this is really interesting. What, you know, what's he going to ask about, oh, the sonship of Jesus or what? The one thing he wanted to ask was, um, at the Council of Jerusalem, they forbade the eating of blood. Why do Christians in Newcastle eat black pudding? And then, of course, there's this big, big barrier. The history of Muslim use of the Bible is largely polemical. So many Muslims have read the Bible only to try and tear it apart. What do you do with that history and can you get over it? Praxis, variety of stuff, but the big thing is, what is this text? Compared to the Quran's view of it, what is it? Is it a book dictated by God? If not, what ought it to be? How do we deal with historical critical approaches as we read the Christian commentaries? And is it possible for a Muslim to handle the Bible not as a, a slightly imperfect Muslim book, but as Jewish history, Jewish scripture, or Christian scripture? There are some of the questions and some of what the book's about. Well, thank you, everyone. It's, it has been 
a real honor to be part of the Reading the Bible in the Context of Islam uh, project and a great pleasure for me to have worked with more than 20 authors and a great publisher as well uh, on this groundbreaking edited volume. And why do I call it groundbreaking? I think I want to explain a little bit about that. But before I do that, uh, I want to ask you a question. Now, I wrote my chapter on, in this book on the Joseph stories. So how many of you have read the biblical Joseph story? Wow. <laughs> how many of you have read the Quranic Joseph story? Wonderful. And how many of you have read both? I think this really represents, you couldn't see it, those of you sitting in the front, but this um, shows of hand uh, represents the state of literature in this area as well. We have a wealth of literature that uh, looks at the biblical stories and the Quranic stories individually. And there are greater, there's uh, centuries of um, scholarship on this and exegesis. But this scholarship is not necessarily interested is either uninterested or doubtful about the helpfulness of reading the two texts together for advancing and deepening our mutual understanding of shared <coughs> sacred narratives. We have another wealth of literature that does look at these two um, texts or scripture alongside each other. However, most of this um, is, is, first of all, smaller than the first individually read um, scholarship. But the um, comparative scholarship of the Quran and the Bible, they often tend to be more focused on the literary uh, comparison of the text and do, do not always go um, very deep into the intercontextual and intertheological aspects that were at um, focus of at least my attention in this book and many others. Um, so our volume is um, groundbreaking in the sense that it is really tackling these intercontextual issues. And um, this is not an easy task because you need to have uh, understanding and analysis at least on three levels. So first you need to know the internal um, world of the text itself. So the issues of linguistics and uh, literature come into play in this level as well. You need to also look at the word behind the text, and that is the, the word to which this text was uh, revealed to or uh, where it appeared. So the kind of original context of, of the text. But you also need to take into account the word of the reader or the word in front of the text. So as a reader, I'm reading this text, what theological assumptions, what judgments do I bring to this text that will then inform my reading of the text? Our colleague Shabir here believes that uh, has really interesting idea of suspension, that one can suspend one's judgment about the scripture <coughs> while going into this intertextual and intercontextual reading. It's very difficult, almost impossible for me to do that and still analyze the text as sacred scripture, to treat it as sacred whereas I'm suspending my judgment. I can't do that. So what I have done instead in my work was to bring my uh, judgments and uh, assumptions to the text, but make them explicit and make them part of the study and see how they have um, informed my analysis and understanding of the text. For example, one uh, issue I can mention here is this Islamic doctrine of the infallibility of prophets that Ida just mentioned as well. There's an Islamic um, conception uh, about prophets that Muslims tend to bring to the reading of the text. So I was trying to look and see, is this really informed by the text or do I bring it from somewhere else to the text? Um, we have authors in our books, for example, Georgina Jardim, who has even looked at um, stories that are not necessarily even parallel. She has looked at um, the story of Queen of Sheba in comparison with the story of Ruth as under the theme of um, a foreigner's, a female foreigner's submission to faith. And I, I find that really interesting. So this is really going beyond the kind of um, comparative literary analysis of, of the two texts. So 
just to um, go a little bit further into um, what I've done in my own chapter in terms of the intertextual and intertheological uh, reading of the Joseph story. Uh, my argument was that uh, subtle narrative strategies and differences have led to major theological differences in the two traditions. For example, looking at the narrating voice, you can see that the Quran, um, well, let's start with the biblical story. So the, the biblical stories are all told by this invisible third person na narrator um, and um, who's informing us about everything that everybody did or even thought, including God. And this is a human um, author which is in accordance with the Judo-Christian um, conception of revelation as a collaboration between human and God and the idea of inspiration. So this is evident in the narrative itself, but also gives us this understanding, this kind of human perspective on story. When you read the Joseph, the biblical Joseph story, you can really sympathize and identify with Joseph because you really see his worries and his um, uncertainties and with Jacob as well. Um, there's that human mm, aspect or that human perspective is really um, interesting and evident in the text. Now if you go and look at the Islamic or the Quranic uh, narrative of Joseph, exactly the same story, but the narrating voice here as well as the rest of the Quran is exclusively from first person God's perspective. The only person who's telling any stories in the Quran is God himself or Allah. And if, if anybody else is saying anything, these speeches are always in quotations. Again, narrated by, Quran, by, by Allah. So what does that mean? That means that we have an exclusively divine perspective on the story. And based on this um, perspective and narrating voice, then we are dealing with um, Joseph, who's already a prophet because God is directly communicating with him. There is a direct mode of communication between Joseph and God in the Quranic narrative. For example, when Joseph um, has a dream and he talks to his father, his father Jacob tells him, yes, this is your dream. It means that you are going to carry the line of prophets and you're also a prophet. When the brothers put him in the pit, um, he, God speaks to him and says, don't worry, it'll be fine, you're part of a bigger plan. Whereas we don't hear anything about that in the biblical narrative, um, it looks more like a very um, lonely place for Joseph. Although God is present in the context, but there is no that, not such direct communication. Again, when Joseph's brothers go to the father and say that, um, Joseph disappeared, we don't know where he is. In the Quranic narrative, Jacob says, no, I know something else is going to happen because of course he's a prophet and that's how we see him in, in the Quranic narrative. Whereas in the biblical narrative, again, you are dealing with more kind of human worries and aspects that everybody can maybe identify with. He's worried, he says, maybe a wild animal has um, killed my son. And this kind of you know, parallel um, perspective goes on again in different areas in the Joseph story, in the prison as well. In the Quran, for example, Joseph is really worried that Potiphar's wife is going to finally seduce him. So he says, God, please put me in prison and avert me from what um, they are planning for me. And God does exactly that. And in prison, he even gives some uh, speech to fellow prisoners, which is almost like a theological sermon. Um, whereas um, Joseph in the Bible, he is again really worried and he thinks, so oh, why am I put in prison? I haven't done anything wrong. And at the end, both of the stories converge and they, they come together and the divine plan becomes manifest. But um, what I've found through my intercontextual reading of the two stories was that we can gain a more comprehensive understanding of not only Joseph's own character, but the theological and even existential messages that the narrative is giving us by looking at, this, looking at it from these two perspectives, 
that I think by reading the two stories together, this perspective also come together in a new way. So I have gained a better understanding of the Quranic story while at the same time being able to read the biblical story in its own terms and its own con context and by that really relating to it on a more serious um, level. Well, thank you. I, I will ask you a question. Okay. If I am a Muslim, and I think you could help me because you've been doing some study on this. If I'm a Muslim and I want to understand the Christian Bible as a Christian, I want to be on the inside, I want to understand it how, I want to read it how they read it. What would be the biggest challenge I would face? Would you even advise me to do this? What, what would you, how do I count the cost of doing this? I mean, in a sense, it strikes me as being a very important endeavor in our multicultural society, but possibly a very dangerous one. And I, I just wonder if you've got some advice you'd want to impart to me, the enthusiastic um, Muslim inquirer. About the Bible? Yes, I want to read it as the Christians understand it. Uh, well, I suppose one way to answer that question is sort of uh, autobiographically because I didn't immediately arrive at the suspension model that uh, Shireen mentioned. Um, I came to that model because I thought that other models, other ways of understanding the Bible were impossible for me as a Muslim. Um, initially, when I first started publishing um, on this area of interfaith, uh, particularly on Christianity, Kierkegaard, um, I did it from an entirely Islamic perspective and a philosophical perspective and I was trained as a philosopher but I was a believing Muslim. Um, and I found that uh, when I look back on that work, like my book, the, the Light and the Enlightenment, which is about Christianity's encounter with secularism, and I'm very critical of that, uh, the way that Christians, in my view, made certain concessions to the secular temper, which I think ultimately those liberties lead to atheism and agnosticism. So I wrote that book as a kind of warning to Muslims that if you want to engage with secular modernity, don't do it in this way. Uh, this is uh, going to lead to ultimately a kind of apostasy. Don't do it in which way? Yeah. Well, I felt that Christians were too eager to make um, accommodations to secularism rather than willing to confront secularism. Don't, don't yeah. follow the way the Christians are approaching secularism. Well, on this particular way, meaning, meaning you should confront secularism rather than accommodate yourself to it, which of course is only true of the liberal scholarly wing of Christianity. I'm sure evangelicals don't uh, accommodate themselves to secularism. I'm sure you're all very happy to confront it. But I'm saying that was, that was where I was coming from. You know, I was a writing as a believer and then <coughs> critiquing certain views in the Bible. Um, and that was uh, a method I found um, unsatisfactory. I have to say in fairness, although I not published this in this particular volume, that there is an analogous method that Christians who study Islam use, meaning uh, even someone I think like Kenneth Cragg essentially, I think used a Christian method to assess Islam. So that for all his literary sensitivity and ability, a great deal of what he says reduces to the lament that why, why isn't uh, Islam Christianity? Um, I think he said that consistently over a long period of time. And I find that un unfruitful, so I wanted to do something different. Then after that, it occurred to me that um, there was actually um, uh, a deadlock between these two religions particularly, not only in terms of competing colonial history, but in terms of competing views about the nature of God and salvation. And obviously that deadlock has persisted. It's had violent consequences uh, throughout Islamic and Christian history. Um, so how could that deadlock be broken? Um, I thought that it was very puzzling for me from a religious point of view because it involved the motives of God, which even as a philosopher, I'm not hubristic enough to probe. Um, I'm sure they cannot really be answered. So I thought that deadlock, obviously people would say like John Hick used to say that, that deadlock can be broken in an eschatological verification. When we die, we'll find out the truth. But that, in a sense, is to give up the quest on Earth. Um, 
I do find that deadlock puzzling. I think it is a deadlock and it cannot really be resolved intellectually or theologically. I think it's actually resolved temperamentally by people. A certain kind of temperament likes the Christian offer, a certain kind of temperament likes the more juridical monotheism of Islam. And of course it's possible that it may in fact be resolved in the future through military power. I mean, as Christians you're lucky you have a Christian superpower to help you, which the Muslims don't have. Um, so maybe you know the Americans will kill all the Muslims and that will resolve that deadlock. Uh, but um, apart from that very drastic solution to the problem, um, in the meantime, in terms of our more humble, uh, modest uh, visions that Ida has initiated, where we look at each other's scripture and look at the deepest issues. I mean, I personally think that you know what I was trying to do at this stage of my you know writing in terms of the deadlock was a bit like what. Uh, I think Aida is also doing and what Kenneth Craig were doing, which is that what are the deepest issues that divide us, not point scoring about trivial matters, about single verses in the Bible or single verses in the Quran or certain aspects of Muhammad's life which may seem outrageous to Westerners. That was a kind of shallow polemic and there's plenty of people doing that from both sides. So I want to do something more profound. But even that method I found didn't really work um, because it was essentially saying that there's a, a deadlock and that in order to resolve it, we'd have to know the motives of God, which are by definition undiscoverable. So I thought that I had to abandon that. And then finally, uh, you know, what Shireen was referring to is that when I started doing the uh, book on Galatians, part of the larger commentary on the entire New Testament, particularly on the Gospels, I thought that I would try to suspend my commitment to my own faith and read the Bible uh, in as fair as po way as possible, in as charitable a way as possible, meaning charity here, meaning that if something seems contradictory or outrageous or wrong, to try and see how it appears to Christians. And of course, Paul is the best possible place to do that because a great deal of Pauline theology is extremely complex, even for Christians, let alone for people who are from outside the faith. So that, in summary, uh, uh, Danny, is what I was doing. The only thing I'd add to that is that the suspension model actually was something that went back to my uh, work as an activist when I, when I campaigned against Salman Rushdie and I wrote a book against him. Uh, I had to get a kind of dispensation from the religious people in Bradford who thought that reading such a book uh, would lead to me accruing um, sin, meaning it's a sinful act to read it. So I wanted to explain to them that I'm only reading it for intellectual reasons. So that's actually where the idea came to me that perhaps if I could suspend my judgment to my faith while reading a work of this type. And so, of course, the Bible is not you know, analogous to Rushdie's book, but I'm saying from the point of view of a believer, certain judgments in the Bible are anathema to a Muslim. They're completely unacceptable. So that's the issue that I set myself. What do I do with those parts of the Bible which I cannot in good faith or conscience accept as a Muslim? That's why I did it. Yeah. I, 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 I kind of want to press you a little bit on this one in the sense that would you recommend me as a Muslim to follow this path? Do you think this is actually a thing that Muslims should do? And... Right, I see your question. Yeah. I, think that, I think that if the, uh, if the Sunni Muslim world to which I belong, the mainstream one, did have a, a, um, an active philosophical tradition, which unfortunately doesn't, since the kind of effective death warrant that was signed for it by Al Ghazali, the man that uh, Martin studies, um, you, you would dispute that. Well, fair enough. Um, so, uh, you know, if there were an active Sunni philosophical tradition, then I think that it would be possible for a class of people, by definition elite in some sense, because obviously it requires a fair bit of knowledge of two scriptures and many languages, especially if you're studying Christian origins. Um, yes, yes, indeed. You know, at, um, at madrasa seminary or at university, you could have serious Muslims who would be able to read and think in the way that, for example, I've done and, and get some guidance for someone like myself. Um, but I think in the current state of affairs, um, because the madrasa education, unlike the uh, you know, training in a seminary, is extremely um, basic and entirely religiously motivated, meaning it doesn't even deal with secular disciplines let alone with the, something that I think Muslims would experience as very dramatically disturbing, meaning to read the Bible on its own terms. They simply, I think, would find it uh, they, that they lack the intellectual patience. I mean, Ida, for example, was mentioning about the incident about David's sin. You know, those kind of things and other passages in the Bible are very offensive to Muslims because of a, 
view they hold about, for example, prophets being safe from sin and so on. Um, whereas, you know, um, there are very sophisticated Christian answers, I find, and especially having worked with Aida, I've realized what those quite sophisticated answers are to these Muslim objections. I think for someone to have a school of, a school of thought or a movement where a lot of people, let's say a fair number of Muslims could do that kind of work at that level, maybe, you know, something that we, Aida and Shireen and you are doing, maybe such a school could arise from that. But I can't honestly imagine it arising autonomously among Muslims in the madrasa setting that I, I have personal direct experience with, for example, you know, in Leicester, let's say, in the Islamic Foundation, I think it would be out of the question. They wouldn't understand the basis. This, this isn't very helpful for multiculturalism, is it? I mean, the picture that you're pre presenting is almost worrying, because what I'm hearing you say is actually it's a very dangerous thing, or even a, a thing that's, that's not attractive to Muslim, or it will not help a Muslim, most Muslim, the majority of Muslims, in terms of interacting with the Bible and, and coming to understand it from another perspective. Is that, is that, is that, is that what you're yeah, saying? I mean, I, yeah, yeah, this, is, this is a big, big, big conclusion. It's not one, the one that I want to hear, but it's... Right. But well, I, I personally briefly. think that... Uh, briefly, briefly. Yeah, briefly. right. The, 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 the curiosity, uh, intellectual curiosity, is a byproduct of political power. It doesn't come to people outside that context. Because Muslims are quite weak politically, they're not curious. I mean, when they were politically secure, they gave the world scholarship, as you know, you know, the golden age of learning, transmission of Greek philosophy. But because they are politically impotent, they are very defensive, so that they're not even willing to make intelligent concessions to modernity, one of which would be to read the scriptures of rival faiths, particularly of Christianity, Islam's largest rival, with, with sympathy and interest and intellectual patience. So yeah, unfortunately, the, the answer is pessimism. Uh, I mean, like a prophet, I suppose I'm pessimistic. Unlike a prophet, I may be mistaken. <laughs> I mean, it's fascinating. Oh, fascinating. I could carry on for about yeah, sure. next, uh, an hour and a half. Yeah. I'd love to keep yeah. brilliant. Sure. I want to hear from you as well, Tanya. Okay. So, yeah. um, so you I, ask me a question. So I, yeah. Danny, your article about um, the, you know, the shock value mm -hmm. of the Bible interested me a lot. Um, I mean, basically, Danny's saying, look, when a Muslim reads the Bible, he's very troubled by certain narratives in it which seem to be immoral, uh, particularly those types like the David sin, right? Um, and actually, I thought that it was interesting in answering all the various objections that Muslims raise, you ultimately say that you think that this is the glory of the Bible, mm -hmm. that it has these, what are perceived to be defects mm -hmm. by the opposition, mm -hmm. right? So in view of that, I'm wondering, uh, do you think that you, you, you find it difficult to take the Muslim objection seriously on their own terms? Um, yes, no, I, I, I see what you're saying. Um, you know, the way my project was just the project of saying, what can I learn from the way the questions the Muslims ask me? You know, why is Jesus speaking Greek when he spoke Aramaic? You know, why right. does this, do these, why are there four Gospels and they don't list up the right way? Why is there Ezra and Nehemiah and the numbers and the people don't fit together and, and so on and so on? And I was thinking, okay, well, I can defend that and I can come up with, you know, sort of in a polemical way. But actually what I want to do is I just want to learn from it and say, well, you're observing things about my scriptures. So what kind of scripture was So that was really what I, all I was doing. And I was hoping that by, by doing that I might help uh, Muslim, normal Muslim people, including yourself, <laughs> um, interact with the scriptures and, and, and contribute to a sort of multiculturalism, sort of, you know, sort of, I understand what you're saying now and I've got it, you, you, you know, yeah. so I was hoping, yeah. um, you know, your conclusion is the very opposite of my hope for that, right. <laughs> but I guess yeah. that, is, that is the joy of the book, is that it's, right. it's actually putting things in tension and it's, yeah. I mean, we both worked, yeah. I don't know how many goes on each of yeah. our chapters, and every right. single chapter has so many different rewrites. No, no, I agree with you. That was the benefit of it. I mean, for example, you know, Shireen said that she brought her judgment to the text rather than suspend it. And that's a completely different method, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, we, all of us, you know, we're working on sometimes the same set of issues and, and, and coming to a different... So, in other words, you, you would say that... Um, a Muslim ought not to feel shocked in reading the Bible? No, I think, I think the Muslim ought to feel shocked because okay. they'd naturally feel it, they'd approach it as if it was the Quran. 
Yes, that's true. You know, and then they come with certain expectations of what kind of thing it would be. Right. And it wouldn't be fully human or even a little bit human. Whereas I think the Christian position is that the scriptures are fully human and fully divine. So they're inspired uh, and, and in, in quite a unique way, but they're incredibly earthy in quite a, another way. So Christians have no difficulty with thinking that the scriptures have scribal errors. And these scribal errors might have even become part of the text. Right. And a bit like a Persian carpet, they've you've become part of the tradition, you know, the, the mistake that you did when your wife walked in the room and you missed a stitch, but now it makes a new pattern. And that, you know, and that actually God could oversee that and, and that be part of it. And all of that is, is naturally an anathema to a, to a Muslim. And I suppose the, the Muslim shock then helped me sort of explore what the very nature of the Bible was. Can I ask a final question, Mike? Quick one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, short in, so in view of that, would you, would you understand why I believe there's a deadlock between the understandings of Scripture and these two faiths, and that the deadlock is enduring? Yeah, I, I actually really enjoyed your chapter, because I Thank thought you. it was really honest. Oh. Oh, okay. Leave it there. <laughs>